They worked hard to forge something almost living from iron. These steam beauties earned a permanent place in their hearts. Now it is serious. We were so happy here. That's football. I have all this power in me, and I'm running it, and I'm loving it, and uh, it's just like, uh, it's, we'll say it's like somebody who, who shoots up. All aboard! became one with these iron beauties. A locomotive is all about steam. You can make it sing, you can make it talk and shout. Steam locomotives were responsible for geographically linking Canada from coast to coast. But beyond that, they brought men together in a shared language, that of passion. A steam engine is something like it was, it had a heart. It had a heart. When the engine would run and it would start to, to, to blast off there, to bark there, it's like it, was, it had a heart. They were alive, those machines. From the trains came the steam, the smoke, the fire. They were alive. But life often separates those who love each other. Unnoticed, a new suitor was on its way, the diesel engine. In the 1920s, small diesel locomotives were used in the marshalling yards to haul the heavy steam engines. These beasts of burden went about their daily rounds, little doubting that one day they would supplant their larger cousins. Long before the diesel sent the steam engine back to the stable, the first steam locomotives had themselves mingled with horses, which pulled carts at the bottom of coal mines. The locomotives were used to pump water to the surface, either by direct pressure or by activating a pump. In the depths of the mines were the first glimmerings of the Industrial Revolution. The idea behind the pump was astute. Steam enters a cylinder containing a piston. As the steam cools off, it condenses, creating a void. The atmospheric pressure drives the piston down. A counterweight of some kind brings it back up, and the cycle begins again. And because inventiveness breeds inventiveness, the locomotive was not far off. In 1804, British engineer Richard Trevithick had the idea of forcing steam into a cylinder containing a piston. The steam vigorously pushes back the piston and escapes from the cylinder by the side pipes. This raises the piston shaft, driving the flywheel back down and forcing the piston back into its starting position, where it is immediately subjected to a new strike, and the steam locomotive was born. What
what a sight to curious Londoners was the first steam locomotive. Richard Trevithick named it Catch Me If You Can. From then on, it seemed that nothing could catch these steamy iron wheels. Less than 12 years after they were invented, the watchwords of the Industrial Revolution, speed, efficiency, performance, had led to numerous improvements. They had doubled in speed, tripled in weight, and quadrupled in power. When steam locomotives took their final bow near the end of the 1950s, they were at the height of power and glory. Among the greatest steam engines must certainly be included the Selkirk locomotives. The first in the series was built in 1928, the last in 1949. They were huge mountain-going engines, able to pull up to 18 heavy cars, plus their own 332-ton weight up steep inclines. At speeds of 16 kilometers an hour, they devoured over 100 liters of petroleum per kilometer. Since 1916, mountain locomotives had no longer used coal. They now ran on fuel. Given full rain, a Selker could race along at up to 100 kilometers an hour. It was an era when it seemed nothing would slow the dazzling speed of scientific progress in its quest to dominate the raw forces of nature. Echoes of his triumphant creed infiltrated the very tone adopted by commentators. Freight trains a mile long, tracks double, locomotives triple in size, Canadian Pacific, Grand Trunk Pacific, Canadian Northern, Intercolonial, Canadian National, names pioneering railroad history. Rain from the West, rain for the world, cities reaching for the sky, Canada united by a bond of steel. All the while, the small diesel engines, still too rudimentary to take to the rails, modestly continued doing their jobs in the marshalling yards. In 1836, in Lower Canada, the idea of a railroad linking the entire continent from coast to coast had not yet gained ground. For the moment, 23 kilometers seemed long enough. That was the distance separating the then very loyalist city of Saint-Jean on the Richelieu River and the small village of La Prairie, located on the south shore of the St. Lawrence across from Montreal. It was Canada's first railroad, but it was not for tourists and pleasure travelers, far from it. In the rugged colony that was Canada, the train was a necessity. If Montreal wanted to enter the modern era as a busy metropolis, it was of major importance that the city secure a fast commercial route to the United States. Of course, there was the St. Lawrence River, but in the colony's early days, the Lachine Rapids made it necessary to send goods by land. This meant traveling over routes that included prolonged portages and roads scarcely suitable for vehicles. Was not the solution to go along the Richelieu River, reach the Champlain Lake, and from there go on to New York? But that was not enough. What was needed was a way to quickly and safely transport goods between La Prairie and St. Jean. This was the only way to gain access to the coveted Richelieu River and the markets to the south. Already in the first half of the 19th century, a few steam-driven inventions had been used to transport loads, but they lacked power and flexibility. The solution came from Scotsman George Stevenson, he invented the first real locomotives in history. Among the oldest models was the Rocket, built in 1830. Barely six years later, Canada's first locomotive, the Dorchester, made its entrance in this country. Even today, this early specimen arouses curiosity. What the first locomotive in Canada really looked like, no one knows for sure. It was only after a lot of research that took around 40 years that we figured out what it looked like as realistically as possible. In particular, we knew that it had been built by George Stevenson's company in Scotland. So we were able to look at the catalog and see what varieties were available around the time the order was placed. So from the point of view of details, there may be a few small details that are different from our model, which is a reproduction of the original. The Dorchester was a very small steam engine, 
At barely 13 feet long, it was no bigger than a present-day automobile. Like all locomotives of that era, it was wood burning. It had no cab, and its simple boiler was covered in wood. It had four huge driving wheels made of wood encircled in metal. The purpose of its large smokestack was to prevent escaping sparks from setting fire to the brushwood. This was nothing exceptional back then. Every time the new invention went by, the farmers feared the worst. The Dorchester was no race car, but it chugged along at the highly respectable speed of 48 kilometers an hour. Il est établi d'après des recherches. It was established through the research that it was a locomotive with only two load-bearing axles, no wheel in front and no wheel in the back. It was such a temperamental locomotive that it quickly earned the nickname Kitten because of the little jolts it gave on the railway track. It took the Dorchester 59 minutes to cover its inaugural 23 kilometers. Its average speed did not exceed 24 kilometers an hour, and its journey was marked by an impressive number of jolts per minute. Nonetheless, it had just entered history. The second generation of locomotives came into being with the John Molson. For several years, the John Molson and its older sister, the Dorchester, were the only two locomotives in use in Canada. After many years of loyal service, the weary Dorchester retired, leaving the John Molson alone in the limelight. quality John Molson had an all-metal boiler. Wood was used less and less often in the engine building industry. After a few small modifications and improvements, this iron beauty began to resemble those typically far west steam engines that had captured the popular imagination. In technical terms, the locomotives were referred to by number. For example, 240, 440, 262, and 282, and so on. This notation system holds no secrets for Dennis Tremblay, a former engineer and railway enthusiast. When we say 462, that refers to the four small front wheels, the three pairs of driving wheels, which make six, and the two other wheels that support the back of the locomotive. That was the system of classifying steam trains. This one is a 462, and the 462 is mainly known as a model for passenger trains. The three driving wheels are pretty big, so that gives it speed. On freight trains, the wheels were smaller, which gave them better traction and more strength, but less speed. Look at the size of these wheels. It's not just a vagary of design. The larger the wheels, the faster the locomotive. So big wheels are often used on passenger trains. Conversely, small wheels improve traction, and as a result, are very useful on freight trains. Just like this 484, a mountain-type locomotive, the Selkirk was capable of pulling huge loads by itself. As a result, it was assigned mainly to freight transportation in mountainous areas. If no such engine was available, a number of locomotives had to be hitched up one behind the other, or pusher locomotives had to be added to the train.
The American Type 440, designed in the United States in the mid-19th century, is probably the most familiar type of steam engine. In one version or another, it's the engine that appears in the classic Western films. The 440 brought a remarkable innovation to the railway world. One of the first improvements that was made to the locomotive was the removal of the rigid axles. The first locomotives were strictly small caliber and had no truck out in front. The truck, or boji, is a sort of undercarriage attached to the front that pivots and makes it easier to negotiate curves and avoid derailment. One of the first engines out of the Delormier works in Montreal was the Canadian Pacific 144. Like the other 440s, it was a real workhorse. It was the very model of the steam engine's success. Versatile, it had many uses on a railway network that was still in its infancy. It was entirely representative of that glorious period in Canadian history, the conquest of Western Canada. Symbolically achieved in 1885, when the last spike was driven into Canadian Pacific's transcontinental railway. Inexpensive to build and maintain, the 440s soon became so popular that by the end of the 19th century, there were more than 25,000 of them on the tracks. They were the locomotives of choice on most North American trains. At that time, the railways were very interested in developing a fleet capable of serving the vast territory of the Dominion of Canada. Colonization was going full steam ahead, and as the number of provinces in the Dominion increased, the number of wheels on a locomotive increased too. A new type of locomotive appeared on the scene. The four six zeros, the famous ten wheelers. First built in the United States and later in Canada, these legendary ten wheelers once again innovated by adding a trailing or carrying wheel. This made the engine stronger, allowing it to become an excellent choice for carrying freight as well as passengers. After that, one locomotive after another was built each with an improved design, in keeping with the watchwords of economic development, speed, efficiency, and performance. Trains had always been used to transport goods and passengers from one place to another. But in time, another more subtle and more profitable concept was added. Traveling for the sake of traveling. It was an era when the railway companies began to be concerned about the image they projected. Superb locomotives, as elegant as they were powerful, were soon swaggering down the tracks. If Canadian Pacific had its 10 wheelers, Canadian National had the 6400 series. They were the picture of elegance, with 16 wheels in a 484 wheel arrangement. They weighed 300 tons and measured 29 meters. They were developed in a joint effort by Canadian National, the Montreal Locomotive Works, and the National Research Council. The silhouette of the 6400 was streamlined to diminish air resistance and eliminate the eddies of smoke that hampered the engineer's view. The 6400 was remarkable for its streamlined shape and graceful design. Some people claim it's the most beautiful locomotive ever produced in this country. The most beautiful perhaps, but not the most royal. The heir to that title was the Hudson. Built in 1931, it first captured honors as the King of Speed, sprinting from Montreal to Toronto at a record speed of 111 miles per hour. The Hudson is still in use today. To passengers of all ages, it shows off the splendors of its kingdom, the area between Vancouver and Squamish in British Columbia. Its princely appearance still arouses admiration.
Henry Reimer spent over 20 years as engineer of this great iron horse. Astride his magnificent steed, he felt like a king himself. The Royal Hudson, of course, the 2850 was the one that brought the queen and king across Canada, and it never broke down all the way from Halifax to Vancouver, so the king, he took his wand out and he says, this is a Royal Hudson, this is a Royal, uh, Royal engine from now on. After King George VI and Queen Elizabeth's royal ride on the Hudson in 1939, Canadian Pacific was given permission to add the designation Royal to this type of locomotive. Who has not dreamed of one day being in the saddle of such a legendary steed, of galloping away at the reins of one of these fabulous iron beasts? Meanwhile, back in the marshalling yards, the diesel engines were becoming stronger and more powerful. Soon the time would come when they too would take to the rails and have their day in the sun. At the height of the steam age, it seemed there would always be work on the railway. Railroading was more than a job. It was a way of life, almost a calling, a family affair. The railway, you had it in your blood. From father to son to grandson, each in turn becoming a railway man. My mother was just as crazy about trains as my father. And she said to him, if it's a boy, he'll take your place. That's what I did. I started out as a fireman. Here's an anecdote about that. When Papa brought me with him to the office in Baudroy, there was a guy named Joe Boisvert, who was his fireman. The day I started, I went to the shop to sign the register to say you've got a fireman and an engineer. And he saw me and said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm working. He said, don't tell me you're working here too now. Working as a fireman? You're a crazy fool. And I said, a fool, yeah, another fool who likes it. Usually as an apprentice, you would go to the shop and you would move engines around the track, different from track to track, put them in the... The roundhouse. The roundhouse was a place where they kept the engines, and then there was a turntable. The engine would go on the turntable. The turntable would turn around and go into a certain, certain slot, and you work there as a hoster for six or seven months. And you also learn how to, how to fire. You would go on trial trips with another crew on the engine. The fireman would show you how to work the stoker. The fireman would show you how to shovel the coal. At one time, we shoveled coal. And at the end of that trip, they would give you a grading, whether they figured you were good or no good or possibility, so forth and so on. Do you have any idea how much coal a fireman had to shovel in a single trip? 250 kilograms, 500, one ton. If you would go, say, we'll say from here to, uh, here to Ottawa, anywhere from seven to eight ton of coal. And sometime when you had a very big train and a hard trip, you would stop at a place called Calumet on the way to Ottawa. Calumet, they had a, they had a place there where you took water and they also took coal. They could take coal there. It seemed the steam engines could never get enough, but their voracious appetite for coal and water would lead to their downfall. They performed well, but this did not entirely compensate for the inconveniences, the need for frequent stops and refueling infrastructures. And these iron beauties produced a lot of pollution. People complained more and more. 
As time went by, these long black ribbons in the sky seemed increasingly like omens of impending death. In the mid-1950s, a site like this, a big steam engine pushing a first-generation diesel, was still common. But the time was nigh when the engines would be lined up the other way around and would stay that way. It wasn't always easy working on these locomotives. It was cold. Sure, it was closed off in front of you, but on either side, take a look at it. You'll see that it's open. So the air came in. One side you were hot, on the window side you were freezing. The snow came in, the cold came in. Sometimes it was tough, I got to admit it. With such difficult working conditions, why do men like Mr. Dever and Mr. Menard remember their years of service with such passion? Perhaps it's in the work itself that we must seek the answer. It was not an easy life, but it was the sort of life where when you got off the train, you felt useful. The fireman as much as the engineer. Of course, there were a few engineers for whom it was just a job, but most had a great deal of respect for their profession and were proud to be part of it. The mark of a good engineer is not only his skill, but also his sense of responsibility. This was particularly true for the men assigned to passenger trains. Answerable to the well-being of hundreds of people, contentedly seated in the dining car or resting in a sleeper, a good engineer had to know how to handle the brake with a light hand. And it's like everything in life, you know. You, you take pride in, in your... You should take pride in what you do. No matter what kind of a job you do, you should take pride in it and be proud to do your job good. Meanwhile, in the marshalling yards, the diesel engines had been taking great strides towards adulthood. After years of improvements, they were now ready to take on the world. And then, what was destined to happen, happened. The day came when one of these engines pulled away from the pack. Canadian Pacific's 7077 diesel-electric locomotive. In order to see if the diesel concept was viable over long distances, the 7077 was sent on a trial run from Montreal to British Columbia. Not only did it easily cover the 3,000-kilometer distance to the Pacific Ocean, but it came all the way back again in fine form. No technical difficulties. No need for water or coal refueling stops. Minimal maintenance. The 7077 had proven that diesel could accomplish the same task as steam. It was then only a matter of time before the entire rail network would be completely taken over by diesel engines. engines had become dinosaurs. All they could do now was to bow out gracefully, leaving behind them memories of a passionate life of service. With diesel locomotive, you just open the throttle and the power is delivered, you know. It's just like, uh, it's not the same feeling. And the steam engine, you had the feeling of, you know, Jesus, this is something. And you look out, a you know, big long nose in front of you there. And the wind blowing and, you know, waving to the people, to the kids and all that. It was, uh, what can you say? Shortly after this interview, Raymond Dever died. to get on and take the next take the next batch up the hill, you know what I mean?
For several years, steam and diesel worked side by side, each pulling its share of freight and passengers. But steam engines began to be assigned more and more often to passenger trains rather than freight trains. For heavy loads, it had been necessary to line up several steam engines in a row. But now, the same amount of freight could in some cases be pulled by a single diesel engine. And even if two or three diesels were required, they still cost less to operate than the steam engines. Scenes like this one, in which a diesel freight train is shunted aside to give right of way to a steam locomotive pulling a passenger train, would soon be relegated to the history books. Before long, diesel engines would have the sole right of way on Canada's railroads. Henceforth, when a train passed another going in the opposite direction, the locomotive of one train would be a mirror image of the other. It was a losing battle. The steam locomotives were no match for their younger cousins. They had to admit defeat. Steam engines had just too many strikes against them. Although diesels were more expensive, they had the considerable advantage of being able to run 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. They didn't need to be frequently verified and completely reassembled at regular intervals like steam engines. For the railways, those exorbitant maintenance costs alone were enough to justify sending steamers to the scrap heap. In addition, unlike diesels, steam engines had to make frequent refueling stops. After 16 hours on the tracks, a steamer could work no longer. Just as when horses were used for transportation, the locomotives had to be rotated regularly. But a diesel engine can go on and on and on. But of all the steam engine's flaws, the most serious is the need for it to be taken back to the shop every five years to be completely dismantled and rebuilt. The diesel engine had made a mockery of the steam engine's claims to superiority. Within 15 years, the tricky task of replenishing water and fuel supplies had become little more than the stuff of laughter. The diesel engine is also more efficient in terms of energy consumption. A steam engine transforms only 10% of its energy into motive power. The rest escapes in great puffs of smoke. With the same amount of energy, a diesel obtains more than double the power. The passage from steam to diesel electric engines allowed the railways to achieve significant economies of scale. But why do we speak of diesel electric engines and not simply of diesel? Right now, this one is electric, even though from the outside it's a diesel model. When we speak of a diesel locomotive, it's always diesel electric. The big locomotives have a diesel engine that turns an alternator and generates electricity for the engine. On a real locomotive, the engines would not be vertical like this. They would be inserted inside the wheels. Because of their tremendous power, we more often think of diesel engines in relation to freight trains than to passenger trains. But diesels are also quieter, cleaner, and more discreet than the big steamers. They give off an impression of strength, but never to the detriment of the climate of calm and comfort that reigns in the cars. With all of these positive attributes, it wasn't long before diesels were heading a number of famous trains, including Canadian Nationals Supercontinental and Canadian Pacific's Canadian.
By the mid-1950s, these elegant trains could travel across the entire country in only 70 hours, cruising along at an average speed of 125 kilometers an hour. Behind the locomotives were some 20 air-conditioned cars, including baggage cars, diners, lounges, and sleepers. The Canadian, entirely built of stainless steel, has a superb panoramic car, which provides an unobstructed view of the majestic scenery. One after the other, CP Rail and CN discontinued passenger service on their lines. In 1977, Via Rail took over all the passenger services in the country. Yet, only a year earlier, Canadian National had caused a sensation with its magnificent new train, the Turbo. In 1976, this high-speed passenger train set a Canadian record by reaching a speed of 225 kilometers an hour. Since the 1950s, no less than four generations of diesel-electric locomotives have taken to the tracks, each more powerful and sophisticated than the one before. From 1,000 horsepower in 1950, the propulsion power of today's engines has increased to 7,000 horsepower. Between 1966 and 1971, the Montreal Locomotive Works delivered 63 of these big Alco to CP Rail. With a ramshackle cab that barely kept up the cold of our Canadian winters, the big Alco had frequent mechanical troubles and spent more than its share of time in the repair shop. It was secretly whispered that many engineers would have preferred one of big Alco's American cousins built by General Motors. Since the first railroads were built over 175 years ago, successive generations of locomotives have had their moment of glory before being superseded by the next big thing. With the coming of the computer age, the train underwent another metamorphosis. The early 1970s saw the introduction of remote control systems in locomotives. This made it possible for the front locomotive to control the operation of all the other locomotives inserted in the train. Diesel engine was a big saving for the railroad because it was cheaper to run. You could run uh, how many units, up to five, six units, all, all in one consist. And uh, you only pay one engineer. He had the steam engine. You have to have five steam engines, five engineers, five firemen. The continued growth of freight traffic in Canada has been made possible by the economies of scale obtained on crew salaries. And at the same time, because all that's involved is to increase the number of locomotives in the train, the railways have gradually lengthened the trains. It's reached a point this year where we'll see trains that are 1.6 miles long, that's nearly 2.8 kilometers. It's really quite phenomenal to see these long trains go by. And it's these locomotives that make it possible, especially the fourth generation ones. This is the 9114, a fourth generation alternating current Mach 90 diesel. It's a modern machine, recently acquired by Canadian Pacific. A Mach engine is powerful, running at 4,300 horsepower. Its tank can hold up to 22,000 liters of fuel, allowing it to travel a great distance before refueling becomes necessary. As with comparable types of locomotives, the great range of the Mach 90 makes it a locomotive of choice for the CP Rail Network's main lines. To this engine is entrusted the delicate task of transporting containers and cars. In the eyes of men like Andre Pilon, responsible for locomotive repair and maintenance at Canadian Pacific, the Mach 90 is a technological marvel. Here you find everything you need for the locomotive. 
indépendant. Les separate Nous pneumatic systems pour les locomotives. Système à air pour tous vos, vos, vos wagons. The pneumatic system for all the cars behind. Here's the throttle to increase engine speed. And here you have the direction control, because a locomotive can move both forwards and backwards. Everything is electronic now. Even the bell, the whistle, it's all electronic, whereas before it was manual, or pneumatic. You can compare a locomotive today to, to an airplane. If you look at a 747, the system on a locomotive may not be quite as sophisticated, but it's comparable. Donc vraiment, un 747 pour une locomotive, c'est des générations de machines. C'est des générations de machines. Un 747 et une locomotive sont des générations de machines dans lesquelles les computers sont en charge, en termes de contrôle, de speed, d'appliquer les brakes. Tout est contrôlé par les computers. Et bien sûr, les drivers sont toujours là dans le train. Les trains qui sont toujours à l'intérieur des... Oh yes, the driver is always needed, from the point of view of human safety, yes. But if it weren't for that, he wouldn't be needed. What a difference between what is being built by Bombardier today and the locomotives built in the early days of the 20th century at the Montreal Locomotive Works. And yet, those high-powered engines are the direct descendants of these early machines. Like their predecessors, the workers in these modern factories must feel a sense of pride to see their efforts result in such splendid machines. Since the arrival of computers, the driver's job has changed considerably. Modern-day engineers carry out their tasks with their fingertips. But many claim that the relation between man and machine has changed irrevocably. There is no longer that sense of fusion of the engine as a living entity, an iron horse, a stallion to be broken in. Time flies, even faster it seems, than our most rapid inventions. For those who love their work, retirement will always come too soon. And what has become of the steam engine? Amazing as it may seem, it has not completely disappeared. Although it had been sent to the scrap heap in part because of the pollution it caused, the steam engine has unexpectedly found a new green vocation, replacing chemical herbicides with steam to weed the area around the railway tracks. The Royal Hudson is living out its golden years, reigning supreme over the mountains. It still climbs with such brio. As for Canada's very first locomotive, the Dorchester, it spent its final years in a factory in Joliet, where it provided motive power. It's not because I'm an old apple tree that I give old apples, said poet Felix Leclerc. This retired CN diesel locomotive was recycled in another inventive manner during the ice storm that hit eastern Canada in January 98. It served as a much appreciated source of electrical energy. Humans have always displayed great ingenuity in the face of necessity, and a sense of humor too. 100 years from now, we'll probably laugh at what we now consider the heights of innovation. And since inventiveness breeds inventiveness, who knows what extraordinary locomotives await us beyond the horizon?